Father God, we do thank you. We thank you for mothers, and we thank you also for watching out for Saeed when he's in prison there. We know lately he's been in the hospital, and he has been getting, uh, he's been recovering better. I pray that they're letting him recover so they can let him go, and he won't be in such physical bad shape and give them, you know, a bad image. Whatever it is, Lord, we want him released. We ask that you would do it. We know that you can. We have no doubt. You could miraculously open all the prison doors that he would need, and he could just walk out. We know that you could change the hearts of people up above to cut him loose. Whatever it is, whatever pressure it takes, we're asking that you do it. But we also know that he's still there, and we've been praying this for over a year. We're not going to stop, but we also know that you're not going to stop. You're not going to stop using this man. And people are there that he has no possibility of contact with except now. And he's talking to him about you, and people are responding. And people are getting saved. The kingdom is increasing rather than decreasing. So we thank you for that, but we pray that you would send him home. In the meantime, comfort him, strengthen him, encourage him, and encourage and strengthen and comfort Nagmi and the kids. And even us, Lord, we're grieving for him. Comfort us, letting us know that you are in control, that you're on the throne, that none of this has gone by without your knowing about it. And Lord, as we look to your word now, we're excited. We came here to hear about you. Now it's time, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke. We're up to chapter 7 now. The bulletin says chapter 6. The bulletin is wrong. I can say that because I do that. But anyway, so we're in chapter 7. So if you turn to chapter 6, just go to the next one to the right. Anyway, but while you're doing that and doing the turning to and from, find... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and mark that as well, because we're going to turn to that later. So it's just a few more books toward the right, toward the back, and find that 1 Corinthians 13, 15, 15, and stick your bullet in there, and then go back to Luke chapter 7. Anyway, I call this message, Mostly Dead and All Dead, No Problem. It's for Jesus, nothing's any problem. So we'll pick it up in verse 1. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, because he'd been doing, delivering what I call, and other people call the Sermon on the Plain, there's a Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, and I think what he taught in Luke's Gospel is a similar teaching, but at a different time, and it's on a flat spot, so it's the Sermon on the Plain. But he's done. When he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I do not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who, were carried, or those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. For he, so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. So we see, first of all, in verse 1, that Capernaum is where he went to. 
And that was basically the hometown of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, one-third of his 12 disciples. Uh, most scholars agree that Jesus made Capernaum his ministry headquarters, possibly using Peter's house. And throughout the Gospels, he spends a lot of time there. So it's logical for him to go there. But verse 2, we see we are introduced to a certain centurion. Now, we are not told this man's name. Quite often in Scripture, names are given. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad that your name's in the Bible. As Chuck Swindoll says, aren't you glad the Bible's already written so you are not in it? Because <laughs> it's brutally honest, man. It does not pull punches. But this guy, we don't know his name. But you know what? God knows it. And nearly 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. That's pretty cool. Now, centurions were interesting men. They were men of character. The ancient historian, I believe you pronounce his name Polybius, but either way, Polybius, either way, they must not be so much seekers after danger as men who can command, steady in action, and reliable. They must not be over-anxious to rush into the fight, but when hard-pressed, they must be ready to hold their ground and die at their posts. So, perfect kind of guy to have be in charge. Doesn't rush in, doesn't cause problems, doesn't, oh, there's trouble, let's get in there, or let's go over there and maybe we can make trouble. But when trouble arises and it's time to take a stand, they do to the point of death if they have to. It's a perfect guy to have, and that's what centurions were like. A centurion was typically in charge of 100 men. It's from the Latin word centuria, which is 100 and whenever a centurion is mentioned in the New Testament, he's spoken of well. Even the one who was in charge at the crucifixion of Jesus, what did he say? Truly, this man was the Son of God. So, we know that they're spoken of well. Now, this guy has a certain centurion. He has a servant. Now, the servant, the word in the Greek is doulos. Some of you may be familiar with that. It means bond slave, a slave for life. So this guy had been a slave his whole life, and it's the same word that Paul used when he described his relationship to Jesus, when he said, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and then he would go on. And what the bondservant was, was someone in the Jewish society, of course the centurion isn't Jewish, but in the Jewish society, if you owed a debt, you could become a slave to the person that you owed the money to. And then you could work it off by being a slave, but it was for a set period of time. Well, at the end of that time, if you decided, hey, you know what, I kind of like this guy. He's got pretty good setup here. He treats me well. I think I'll decide to be his servant the rest of my life. Well, then you'd put your ear up against the doorpost, and they would take an awl and pierce it, drive it through a nail or something sharp, in through your skin into the wood. Does that sound familiar? A nail through skin into wood as a servant? Anyway, for life. So they would do that, pull that out, and then put a gold ring in, and that identified you as a doulos or a bond slave. So that's the, what the Jews would do. Now, in the Roman society, I'm not sure, but what they meant was here, this guy was a slave for life. Now, in Roman culture, slaves were nothing more than property. In fact, there was a Roman writer on estate management. I don't know if you guys ever get any of those estate letters. How do, you get older, they start sending you estate management things. And, and I think, my estate, let me see. I think I, wait, wait, here, oh, there it is. There's my estate. And you're like, how are you going to survive into retirement? I'm going to die in the pulpit, guys. I have, my retirement plan is post-death. I don't really, anyway, so historian, the, there's a Roman writer on estate management for Romans, and he recommended that their farmers in their region examine their farm implements every year and throw out the old ones and the broken ones. That's not bad management. That's good. You don't, you're not wasting time trying to use bad tools. Well, he also recommended they do the same thing with the slaves. Go through, find the old ones, the broken down ones, get rid of them. Just toss them out. Toss them away. In fact, normally when a slave was past being able to work, he was thrown out to die. They didn't even think of them as people. They were lower than, probably treat pets better and their cattle better than the slaves. But it wasn't the case with this one. This servant was dear to him. The word dear was held in honor to be prized, to be precious. This is not the typical Roman slave relationship, which speaks well of whom? not only the slave, but of the centurion, because he went way beyond what they normally did. 
And now this slave was sick, which means miserably ill. He didn't have a head cold. He was ready to die, which is hovering between life and death. They weren't sure if he was going to make it. In fact, they were thinking he wasn't. So verse 3, when he heard about Jesus, oh, this means two things. Number one, he'd heard about Jesus and what he was able to do. And secondly, somehow he heard he was in town. Whoa, healer boy's around. <laughs> Let's get him over here and see if we could do something about it, right? So what did he do? He sent elders of the Jews to him. Now, these weren't priests. These were not Pharisees, Sadducees, or the, um, even a rabbi or the scribes. These men, I believe, would have been elders as in elders in the leadership of the town. Because remember, this is in Israel. So they had leaders in their town, elders, the ones who would sit at the gate and do business and all. So he sent them, and that, well, they went pleading with him, pleading with Jesus to come and heal his servant. This, again, says a lot about the centurion. Because even though these elders weren't priests or Pharisees, they would still normally have nothing to do with a Gentile. Ew. Gentiles have cooties, if you will, right? Let alone a Gentile who was one of the hated Romans. And worse, a Gentile who was a hated Roman from the Roman army and a centurion to boot, a leader in the army. It's just like it keeps getting worse and worse. But this Gentile, this Gentile Roman, this Gentile Roman centurion was different. And they saw that. And I also believe that he personally sent Jews to Jesus because Jesus was Jewish. He could relate to his own people a lot better. And if his own people stuck up for, not were stuck up, but stuck up, defended this Roman centurion, well, then perhaps Jesus would respond. Because I don't think the centurion has a relationship with Jesus interpersonally. I don't think he knows him. So, verse 4 that says, when they came to see Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. The begging word, begged, is parakaleo, which is to beg, to entreat, to beseech. The Greek word is in the same family as another word in the Greek that you may be familiar with, parakletos, which is the word comforter. And it's not one of those blanket things that your grandma makes for you. We're talking about the one that Jesus, in the upper room, in his discourse, in the end of the Gospel of John, when he talked about, it's to your advantage that I go away, because I will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, one who comes along, like a paramedic, comes alongside you, in between you and the doctor. The Holy Spirit comes to us, in between us and Jesus, to bring us to him. Okay, that's what he's doing. So, he says, basically... These Jewish elders came alongside Jesus, begging him to come. That's what they were doing. And they were saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. See, these Jewish elders felt a strong bond with this centurion, this Gentile Roman centurion. Amazing. The oppressors, one of the leaders of the oppressors, they're defending him and having a strong bond. And when they said they, he was deserving... That means he was having weight, having the weight of another thing of like value. In other words, this Roman centurion measures up to our scale, our standard. He's not typical. He's not a normal guy. This guy's better than most. So why is that? They give him two reasons in verse 5. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Again, loving the nation of Israel is unusual among the Romans. I remember, I think it was in the Passion of the Christ when Pontius Pilate talks about being in Jerusalem and he hated it there. <laughs> He's just like, man, I'm in this outpost. I can't believe I got banished here. You know, a lot of them don't like it there. It's not Italy. It's desert in, in um, Israel. So anyway, the point is he loves their nation. And the elders use a word that's translated in the Greek Agapeo, which is the highest form of love, which is like God's of unconditionally loving. That's the type of love he had for the nation of Israel. Unusual. And has built us a synagogue. He built them a church, man. <laughs> a place to meet. I would like that. You know, someone builds me a church. In fact, I don't know if you guys knew, but when we first moved here to CUNA, the church from Meridian, there's a development going in, and the part of the development, they wanted to have a church in it. 
and they wanted to have it seen from Linder, and it would be at the end of the street, like a little white chapel, kind of like that chapel by Bronco Stadium in Boise, only a bigger version, not much bigger, hold about 100, which is actually bigger than this, actually funny, isn't it? Anyway, and they wanted to build that, and they were going to try to supply as much funding and materials and donate the land to us, and I'm like, wow, I love that idea. Development never happened. We eventually had to move on to another thing. It was part of what God used to get me out here because it's like the carrot was free church. Come on. Come to the city. I want you. Free church. Okay. We came here, and then we got this place, which I'm not opposed to. I like it. I think it's perfect. It's great. Good job. You do all things well. Anyway, but he built him a synagogue. Now, there's a man named Herschel H. Hobbs who's a commentator, and he suggested that this centurion paid for the synagogue with his own money. That's what he's saying. He says, that's what has built us a synagogue. That's what that means. He didn't just supervise the construction. He funded it, which, if he did, shows his devotion to Israel. This centurion was a good man. He was a friend of the Jews, and he's quite possibly a God-fearing man as well. There were people back then who liked the idea of the Jewish God. They just didn't like the idea of Judaism. Circumcision? Ah, no. I don't think so. I'm good. How about... The dietary laws, mm, I don't know, bacon and eggs just sounds really good. So, you know, how about uh, the Sabbath day? Nah, you know, the whole not working thing, not lifting up more than the weight of a fig. And nah, I don't think so. But this God you guys talk about, he's pretty cool. I like that. I like him. So there were people that would change, become prosel pro proselytes. Anyway, converters converted to Judaism and they would go through the whole process. There were others that were just interested in the God. Well, guess who Jesus is? He's the God <laughs> that they're looking into. So I think that Jesus would have known by the Holy Spirit in him that this guy would have been interested in the real God. The, he's getting down to the brass tacks. He's getting rid of all the superfluous stuff and saying, let's get down to this God. I'm interested in him. And I think that's what he was. I think he was a God-fearing man. So verse 6, what happened? Then Jesus went with them. What I put in my notes is when they said these things to Jesus, it worked. <laughs> he decided, let's go. I'll go to his house and check out this servant and heal him. He's on his way to the house, but when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Now, it seems like the centurion may have had a change of heart. Because first he sent the Jewish guys, come on to my house. But now he sends friends and not Jewish elders to stop Jesus in his tracks. And he said, hey, just, you, you probably better not come. Why? For I am not worthy, which is sufficient in ability or fit. Like, what, what is, isn't that a term that they use? You're not fit for service? That's what he's saying. I'm not fit to have you come. Because the Jewish elders, what did they say? They said he was deserving, that he measured up, that this, this guy's worthy. Come. He's earned it. The centurion, instead of sending Jews this time to relate to Jesus, he sends friends, probably Gentiles now, people that know him a little better maybe, you know, and can relate to him from the Gentile perspective and say, you know, He's saying he's, he's not what these guys are bragging about. I mean, he's done this stuff, but that's just stuff. You know what I mean? It's, the reality is he's not perfect. He's not that great. I mean, he's, no one is, right? No, nobody is, and that's the point. He's getting a little more honest. The centurion said this about himself, that he was not sufficient in the ability to have Jesus come to his house. And he goes on, the word, interesting, the wording, when he says, do not trouble yourself to come here. That sounds just like don't waste your time. It's more than that. The word trouble was a Greek word often used to describe the trouble of being skinned alive. What? That's trouble? Yeah. I think that I would try to avoid that. <laughs> being skinned. It isn't trouble like, you know, it's a couple of blocks out of your way. No, it's being tied down and having your skin cut off. What? Of course not. What he was saying was this. I think he was telling Jesus, don't trouble yourself by having to enter a Gentile's home. See what I mean? There's a difference. It's like, I know that would be extremely emotionally painful for you because of your society, because of, of the way you believe and the, the uncleanness of Gentiles. And besides, I don't even deserve that. I'm not sufficient to have you visit my house. 
And then he goes farther. Verse 7, therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. And worthy means to judge worthy, to deem deserving. He did not think he deserved that. Now, the Jewish elders said he measured up. The centurion said he was or insufficient in the ability to have Jesus come to his house. Now he says he doesn't even deserve to go where Jesus is. I, I don't even deserve to meet you halfway. I'm not worthy. <laughs> that, but that is genuine humility. I don't deserve you to have you come to my house, not even to go. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, that is amazing the understanding he has. I will tell you this, not one human being has or has ever had this kind of power. I don't have this kind of power to say the word and something will be done. Miraculously, I'm sure you don't have this kind of power. Sorry to let you in on that, but you don't. But you know what? We know someone who does. The very beginning, first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 we see this kind of power in action. Eight times in Genesis 1, we read, and God said, and things were created. They happened because he, you know, as a parent, clean up your room, why? Because I said so. No, God said, let there be light, there's light. God said, let the dry land appear, the dry land appear. God said, let there be plants and bushes and trees, and <clears throat> they happened. You ever had power like that? God said, let the weeds be gone. I say, lawn, be mowed. I say, dog, don't dig that up. I say, I'm a failure because I can't get anything done by saying it. <laughs> it's fascinating to me that what does God say to us as our reward? He says, well done, good and faithful servant. So he wants us to do, but all he has to do is say, and he does by saying. Amazing power. And this guy recognizes that. Now, it's interesting, too, in the word Hebrew, in the Hebrew, in Genesis 1, where it says in the beginning, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth, created is bara in the Hebrew, which means to create out of nothingness. There was nothing there, and he said it, and it came to, into existence. Do you realize the concrete you can tap your foot on, the chair you're sitting on, the skin and bones you're made of? are here because God spoke and it happened? Wow. I mean, that makes, you don't need drugs. You don't need alcohol. You can just think about that and go, whoa. <laughs> but in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we see the one who actually did the creating was Jesus. So the centurion got it right. He knows that Jesus can simply speak the word and his servant will be healed. And even more, but wait, there's more. The centurion showed his affection for the servant by the word he used here. The servant word is pais, P-A-I-S, which can be translated child or boy. It's the same word that Luke uses earlier in his gospel when he talks about the young child at 12 years old being at the temple, Jesus. It's an affectionate term, and that's what this guy's using. He loves this guy, this servant of his. And then the centurion goes even farther because he says in verse 8, For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. <laughs> Notice he says, I also am a man placed under authority. What does that mean? Jesus, I know you are under authority. I'm the same position you are in that respect. Now the Roman, what he's saying is, I'm under authority, which gives me authority to have authority over the people under me. Because the authority is not mine, the authority I have to tell them what to do comes from way up high, all the way up to Caesar. So you see what he's saying? That authority I have is not just because I think it's a good idea. It's because they're saying so, and they're giving me the authority to tell you to get it done. And Jesus, you have that same authority because I know the authority you have comes from God. You're under authority, and that's how you're able to do this stuff. What an incredible understanding this guy had. It really is amazing. Jesus can perform miracles, and he's right because of that authority. And he says, because I have soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes, and my servant, do this, and he does it. It's the natural order of things for a centurion. All the men under his authority obey his orders, because he's also under authority. 
So the authority he is under gives him his authority, and he recognizes Jesus is in the same position. It's a natural order of things for Jesus. It's just unusual for a human being to recognize that, especially at that point in Jesus' ministry, and especially being a Gentile. This is why in verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Now Jesus is going, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Amazing. There are only two times in Scripture we are told that Jesus marveled. And both had to do with faith. Here Jesus marveled at the faith of the centurion. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, he was in his own country, in his own hometown, and he marveled at their unbelief. Both had to do with faith. Quite a contrast. But think of it. This centurion impressed Jesus, and the people in his own hometown did not. His own countrymen. I have a question for you. Do you impress Jesus? I know that many times I've made quite an impression on him myself. <laughs> Not sure good or bad, but I know I've done that. So, how does Jesus respond? Well, Luke tells us that he turned around and said to the crowd that followed him. So I believe Jesus turned around to make sure that people would get his point. I mean, he's standing there. He's having this interaction. He's on the way to the house. They're all fired up. Let's go see this miracle happen. And they're there. And then Jesus is stopped by the friends. And they say, you know, no. And they told him the whole thing. He's not worthy. But he knows if you just say the word, the servant will be healed. And Jesus turns around. That would get everybody's attention from the crowd even more so. He's saying something to us. This is important. They could see his face, hear his voice. And he says, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And he doesn't mean the country. He means in the people of Israel, the Jews. This Gentile Roman centurion understood Jesus better than anyone Jesus had met in his entire life. That's saying something. That's amazing. And this Gentile... Roman centurion applied his understanding to his faith and Jesus rewarded it. Now the centurions, the Jews, what did they say? He's worthy. The centurion says, I'm not worthy. And Jesus honors that. Jesus does and says he has the greatest faith I've ever seen. Amazing. So what's the end result? Verse 10. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. So Jesus didn't go to the centurion's house, but he did heal the servant from a distance just by his word, right? That's what the centurion said, just by his will. He said, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. But it gives us hope that Jesus can work in us and on our behalf from a distance. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, so he's not at a distance in that respect. But have you ever seen him personally? Has he ever come to your building, your house, your place of work? Physically, you've seen him? Without the aid of mind-altering drugs, have you ever seen Jesus? <laughs> no. I don't think so. If you have, I want to sit and have a chat. We'll just stop now because that would be more interesting to me. <laughs> no offense, Bible, but you know what I'm saying? If you, I'd, I'd take time to listen to that. But basically... He responds, and what happens? The end result is from a distance, the servant is made well, and well means to be in good health. He got a bill of good health from the doctor, basically, and Luke, being a doctor, would know exactly the term to use. Now, Luke doesn't tell us if Jesus even said the word to heal him out loud. If you don't say abracadabra, will the rabbit come out of the hat? Jesus isn't a magician. He's God. As far as we know, Jesus just decided the servant would be healed, and he was. <laughs> I just love that. Do you begin to get the understanding that this Jesus we worship is able to handle anything we are going through? Anything you're going through, he can just will it to happen and be taken care of. He doesn't have to say it. He doesn't have to go, okay, now, let's see. He has two flat tires Okay, we'll save that, and then the transmission could help. Oh, and then, you know, his, his son is really having trouble. Uh, where, is, where is that? He can just think it. Just will it, and it'll happen. That's the God that we serve. 
Jeremiah 32, verse 27 says this, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Absolutely not. Nothing. So now, we have looked at Jesus dealing with a person, as they say in The Princess Bride, who was mostly dead. Now, we will see how Jesus does with one who is all dead. That normally, the only thing you can do with that is what? Go through his clothes and look for loose change. But, you know, Jesus has better plans involved. Now, this next occurrence has several contrasts, which we'll get into later. But verse 11 and 12, now it happened. Remember that. This happened. This is an actual occurrence. This is not a made-up story. This is not once upon a time. This is not Grimm's fairy tales. This is not a cartoon. It happened. That he came into a city called Nain that on the day after, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. So we have a large crowd following Jesus. The servant of the centurion has been healed. It's the next day. He's going to this other town. It's about a day's journey, and he's getting, he's getting close to the town. They're rejoicing. They've had a good time in the, home, in the home base, basically, and they're traveling. It's probably a good rejoicing mood. And what happens? Well, they get to Nain. You got a widow's son has died, and there's a funeral procession heading out of town. And that's not a happy occasion. And there's weeping and wailing, and there's music being played that's sad. And the mother is grieving and crying, and the son is dead, and she's a widow. She has no one to take care of her. But the two meet at the gate of the city, and something amazing is about to happen. Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, this is the first time in his gospel that Luke referred to Jesus as the Lord. Fascinates me. I don't think anything is an accident in Scripture, so I think it's possible that he did this to show Jesus is Lord even over death. But when he saw her, he had compassion on her. Notice this. Luke did not point out that Jesus saw the son and had compassion on him. He saw the mother and had compassion on her. She was the one who was doing the grieving. She had no husband, and now she had no son. There'd be no one to take care of her. There's no welfare system in their society. She's now alone in life. Now, she's not alone in the city because there's a big crowd, which showed two things. Number one, the people of the town possibly loved her, maybe even loved her son, and they were showing their respect. And number two, she probably had hired mourners, and they were just they were busy playing sad music and wailing. And you're like, what? It's another thing they did in their society. The more mourners you had, the more musicians you had, and the people crying and wailing was, show, was a sign of showing how much that person was loved. We do it now with flowers, right? All the flower displays. Do you think the dead guy can smell them? No. In Japan, they throw rice in the grave. You say, why? They can't eat it. Can they smell those flowers you buy? No, that's true. They can't. And it's just for the living, okay? So it's proving the love that you had. They would hire professional people. Maybe they don't re- weren't even that acquainted, but they know how to wail. Man, they know how to cry. <laughs> and even the poorest people basically would hire two people to play flutes and one woman to wail. Because, man, no one can wail like a woman. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry, women. But that's just true. And especially if they're good at it and they, it's their job. Think if, think if that were your job. What do you, I'm a wailer. Whoa, okay. No, I don't need to see your work. I'm good. <laughs> so it's possible the mother was leading the procession. They're heading to a cemetery. Jesus is just coming to the town, right? Perhaps he knew by the Holy Spirit to be there at the right time. I'm sure it was a, I know it was a divine appointment. But the point is, here's this great happy procession getting to the town, and here's a funeral procession heading to a cemetery. In his compassion, Jesus says to her, do not weep. Now, if he weren't Jesus, this could be a heartless thing to hear. Think about it. She's weeping, and he says, don't weep. Cry, baby. I mean, that's how it could come across, right? What are you crying for? He's already gone. What are you, is your crying going to bring him back? I mean, why are you doing that? He's not saying it's wrong to grieve. Grieving is a natural part. What did he do when Lazarus died? He wept over death itself, if nothing else. So it's not the point. He's not saying don't weep. He's saying you won't need to be weeping. 
Just hang on. Just hold on a few more minutes, and you, your weeping will be gone. Okay? He's not saying grieving is bad. He's saying you won't need to. He's saying, in fact, you can only say this kind of thing if you have a better option. And Jesus has a much better option he's about to show her. So verse 14, then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. See, in the Jewish society, they wouldn't, they didn't have, we think of a coffin as what we think of as a coffin, right? The strange shaped box with a lid, right? And the lid would be open. No, it's more like a stretcher that they would have carried him on. Be wrapped, covered in a cloth, but very much open is the way they would carry them to the graveyard. So he walks up and he touched it. He touched it. <laughs> in their society, touching a dead body made you unclean. Um, is this reference in your notes? I don't think so. Numbers 19, 11 through 13. If you're a note taker, I, I apologize. There's another one coming up too. Numbers 19, 11 through 13. It gives us the ritual for cleansing after touching a dead body. Touch a dead body is the whole thing. You have to go through washing and waiting a week before you were considered clean. But Jesus touches him. He realized that human need overrode ceremonial ritual. And besides, when the guy sat up and raised, did he, did the touching the dead count? Because now he's alive. So maybe he's not considered that dirty anyway. But Jesus doesn't care. Being God, he's like, oh, it's cool. It'd be fine. I think it's interesting that Luke included the detail, though, that those carrying the child, the boy, the young man, stopped. I think it'd be fascinating. You're there, there's a big crowd, and okay, that, maybe that's that Jesus, that traveling rabbi guy, and they're carrying it, kind of going along, the wailing's going on, the music, and Jesus walks up, don't weep, and like, what? And then he goes by, to, starts to reach out his hand. You probably stop, go, what's he doing? What's he, he touched him. He touched him. He touched him. He touched him. You don't do that. So he's, they stop. It would definitely be an attention getter, okay? So there's, I bet the, you know, it'd be one of those things, The music stopped, everything, the wailing. Woo! You hear the one wailer going on there. <laughs> Stop. He touched the dead body. <laughs> you don't do that. I'm sorry to make this funny, but it's, this is what's going on. So what does he say? Young man, I say to you, arise. Every time Jesus raises someone from the dead, he talks to them. Lazarus, come forth. Little girl, I say to you, arise. And here, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, the mother didn't ask Jesus to help. Did you notice that? We went through the whole story about the centurion begging, please, sent two, two cohorts of friends. Just please, you can just say it. You don't even have to come. Just do it. Please, please, please. Here, this one's died, and she says nothing to Jesus. She doesn't ask him. No one from the crowd said, oh, it's Jesus. He can fix it. Nothing. Even his disciples didn't offer a word of encouragement to heal to resurrect, not resurrect, because that would be for eternity, but to raise him from the dead. Jesus acted alone because of his great compassion. And compassion has been, been defined as this, your pain in my heart. I know Bill Clinton say that name, and some people go, oh. Others go, oh. But anyway, he was quoted as saying what? I feel your pain. When you genuinely do, though, it usually moves you to action. If nothing else, then to just sit by the person and comfort him. Just be there. So Jesus was moved with compassion, and he was unafraid to touch the dead body, and he went much farther, and then he told him to sit up. Now, maybe he wasn't dead, you might say. Well, the word arise means to arouse from the sleep of death, to recall the dead to life. He wasn't mostly dead. He was all dead. Even Miracle Max gave up on the guy. Romans 4.17, the other reference that is not in your notes, Romans 4.17 says, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. That's the God we have. He brings life to the dead. And if you don't think so, if you're born again now, you were dead before. You know it. Spiritually, you were dead. And now you have life. And you have so much more exposed to you and made real to you. If not physically dead, Definitely, you were spiritually dead. So what happens? Verse 15, so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. <laughs> this is why Jesus said to the mother, don't weep. You won't have any need to. Just hang on. He knew he was going to raise the young man from the dead. 
Now, Luke tells us the young man began to speak. I think the fact that he sat up would be a trip enough. He touched him. Oh, whoa, look at that. He's alive. And he's talking. We don't know what he said. I wish we did. Part of me wants to know. Hey, you know, I was really dead, just in case you want to know. I was dead, dead. Heart stopped. Whole thing. Kidneys quit. Couldn't feel a thing. In fact, I was out. I was watching this from up above. I was like, what's he? He touched a dead body. Oh, it's me. Whoop. Hello. <laughs> I'm back looking through the eyes. You know, whatever he did, but he began to speak. We shouldn't speculate because I, I love what Pastor Chuck used to say. When the Bible is silent, so am I. It's not often that I'm silent. But anyway, so it's enough to know that he talked. It's just another proof of life. You know, there's a funny thing about Jesus. He had a way of breaking up funerals and stopping people from mourning. Here he raised this widow's son. In the next chapter of Luke, we'll see that he raises the daughter of Jairus. And we know in John 11, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Because Jesus is the Lord of life. Satan came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to have a, not just a life where we barely scrape by spiritually. Where it's, oh, okay, I'm saved. Thank you. No, Eeyore, come on. Stop it. <laughs> have some joy in your life. Have some happiness in him. Okay, 16 and 17. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God. So they were fearful, not scared, but respectful fear. And it is a little scary when a dead person comes back to life, right? It came upon all, and they glorified God, which is a perfect result, saying, a great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And the report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Bad news travels fast, but this kind of news really travels fast. God gets the glory. More fame for Jesus. They call Jesus a great prophet, which is a great title, but I think it's a little lacking considering he's God Almighty in the flesh. So they kind of got it wrong. It's possible that they were comparing him to Elijah and Elisha, who had both raised dead sons back to life. God used them. So it's a possibility they're saying that. But if you love Jesus, you'll get, get it right eventually who he is. You'll learn. That's what they will do. And it is true that God has visited his people. Now, at the beginning of this account, I said there were a few contrasts. And I'm going to get to those right now, and then we'll wrap this up. Number one, we have two crowds involved in this story about the widow's son. First, we have one crowd that's heading toward the city. It's rejoicing with Jesus leading it. The other crowd is leaving the city, weeping with death leading it. And the question is, which crowd are you in? Are you in the crowd that's headed toward heaven, rejoicing with Jesus leading way? The city, the new Jerusalem, are you headed that way? Or are you in the crowd that will have to leave heaven mourning because you only have death? It's a question you need to answer. Number two, we have two only sons. One was alive but was destined to die. One was dead but was destined to live. Number three, we have two people who are acquainted with suffering. We have the man of sorrows acquainted with grief, Jesus, quoted as being that in Isaiah 53, verse 3. And then, of course, we have the widow who was weeping because she had no hope because her son had died. And then we have two enemies meeting, another contrast. Jesus and death, I don't know if you know this, they're enemies. Because 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says this, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Jesus hated death. It was not in his original design. Do you know what the tree of life offers? Eternal life. That's why in the Garden of Eden, after they ate of the tree that they were not supposed to eat of, God said, it, it, we, we can't have them eat of that tree of life and live eternally in sin. So let's get rid of them, knock them, keep them out, put an angel to guard the way so they can't get back to that tree. It was out of love that we got kicked out of Garden of Eden because he doesn't want us to eat of that tree and stay sinful for eternity. Jesus hated death, but he hated enough to do something about it. He came and died in our place so we don't have to be dead in hell for eternity in sin. We brought death into this world. Jesus defeated death forever on the cross. In fact, now it's time to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. If you're there, if you have it marked, go to verse 54. It's near the end of the chapter. It's on page 1325 of the Loner Bible, but... It says, verse 54, so when this corruptible, 
has put on incorruption. That means us, when we who are corruptible, who easily sin, we get to put on, remove corruptibility and put on incorruptibility. We will no longer be able to be corrupted by sin. Is that a good deal? Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. amen. That sounds great. And this mortal has put on immortality. That means our bodies that are dying, some of us are closer to that than others, <laughs> will put on a body that no longer can die. So you no longer have a sin nature and you're in a body that won't die. Both sound great to me. Then what happens? Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written in Isaiah 25, 8, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. So the sting of death is sin is what causes us to die and the law points out that we're sinners and we're going to die. That's where the strength of it is. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the victor here over this dead son, right? And he's the victor over our death because of sin, spiritual death, if we just accept it. So which crowd are you in, that rejoicing crowd or the mourning crowd? Think about it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for what Jesus did constantly, either taking care of someone who was mostly dead or all dead. You're just, you just have power over everything. And the only thing, really, that you don't have power over of is our own hearts, whether or not we'll accept you. I believe in Scripture it's taught that that's up to us. So I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, who hasn't made that decision, that they would that they would say, I need you, and ask you to be their Savior and Lord because they're sinners. Everybody in this room is. And as Paul said, I'll say it about myself, of whom I am chief. And he, the more we're recognizing our sin, the less we stand it, the less we can put up with it, the less we like it. Because we see how perfect and wonderful and, and glorious you are. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for these historical accounts i hate to say stories because it sounds like they're made up but the fact that you without possibly even seeing it healed a servant and then certainly by touching a dead body and saying arise he did i thank you lord for everybody here who has asked you to be their savior and lord because they have had you say to them arise and spiritually they are alive and one day, we'll be with you for eternity. We're looking so forward to that. Thank you for beating death. It's the final frontier that we're literally deathly afraid of. But we don't have to be, because you'll go through there with us. Because you've already gone there and already beaten it. In Jesus' name, amen.